Good morning. Welcome to, uh, I guess I'm the first presentation, Perspective 2015. I'd like to thank uh, Nicola Leonardi for his kind invitation and the members of Perspective 2015 and the plan for their generous invitation um, to speak to you this morning. Uh, I'm George Rinaldi. I'm an architect here in New York City and uh, I've been an educator as well as been in practice for the last 40 years. Um, the title for the talk this morning is called In Situ Design, People, History, and Place. Um, this is, uh, uh, I, I recently published a very large monograph. This is the title of the book, uh, which is, uh, will be available this week um, here in New York and other, other locations. Um, it, it was an opportunity to look back at 40 years of practice and see um, where the, where the, the uh, design impetus has come from over the last 40 years, my, uh, my time in architecture. And I came to understand that architecture of the 20th century um, has been really dominated by one very, very strong idea, uh, uh, which I, I take some uh, exception to, uh, the idea that everything we build in, in modern architecture and contemporary architecture is the polar opposite of the environments that we build in. Uh, it was most espoused, I think, by the early drawings of uh, Mies van der Rohe. Uh, here you can see in the uh, city of Berlin, um, the city rendered in very dark black chalk, the dirty, grisly, unpleasant city, and of course the new architecture represented in this crystalline uh, clarity of glass and steel. But of course, uh, and, and there were further representations in architecture, and I think this has really been the dominant mode of architectural representation and architectural theory uh, well over the last hundred years. Um, and I think it's time to really reconsider that position. For centuries, architects and, and builders and societies have built buildings that were both part of the texture of the city and certainly anomalous to the city. They were exceptional buildings within the city. Here in Siena, you can see, of course, the Duomo. Uh, and the main public, the Palazzo Publico, uh, the main public building in the city. You can see how the buildings in some cases were exceptional um, and, and colored and textured rather differently. You could also see the attention paid to the ability to weave this building back into the cityscape. If you look uh, just uh, on the side uh, of the building where the, the piece of the, of the Duomo building gets folded against the uh, buildings that are rendered in Siena brick, the buildings of the city, you can see what attempts were made to, to uh, put these pieces back together. Same in the, in the, in the uh, piazza, uh, the main piazza del Campo, the main public building of the city, again, uh, a rather exceptional building made in the same material of the city with its interior uh, range of space. Um, again, celebrating the public capacity of the building, but uh, feeling very much part of the architecture of the city of Siena. These processes, which were practiced, uh, I think, in many European cities, uh, show up in, in different ways um, here in the, uh, in the uh, uh, composition of Pisa. You can see, of course, the celebrated Leaning Tower, but more importantly in the baptistry building where uh, the attempt to, to produce a duality of meaning in the buildings by rendering the backside of the of the um, uh, sacristy of the baptistry building in the terracotta tile roof material of the city, and on the front side of the building, it's rendered in stone. Uh, there's literally a dichotomy across the center line of the building. So once it faces its formal composition as part of the of the complex of buildings of the of the Duomo, the baptistry, and the tower. It occupies a more formal realm when seen from the backside of the building. It occupies a more casual uh, realm and part of the cityscape of Pisa. Um, these buildings were are had have their exceptional interiors. Of course, they're rather compelling and extraordinary in in the sense of program, um, and none more spectacular than a very small building in Rome, the Tempietto, which we see slightly. Uh, contrapositionally because the uh, the existing uh, space 
that's left is rectangular. The building was round. But if you look at the original drawings, of course, it was meant that the space would be configured, the, the space of the cloister would be configured to be responsive to the new Tempietto that was placed within it. This synchrony uh, of buildings and landscapes, buildings and cities, uh, I think is a very important uh, component for us to revisit and reconsider. Uh, it, the, even in representations uh, where the subject matter and the content was clearly exceptional, <clears throat> um, in here, uh, Christ charged to Peter in, in the painting by Perugino, um, you can see architecture setting the stage within which this uh, rather uh, uh, special uh, transition takes place. Um, architecture has always been and remains always the configuration and container for the narrative, the stories of, of um, the special stories uh, of either religion or politics or our, all of our own personal inhabitations. And you can see how the program, the, the infusion of program produces reverberations into the architecture here in all the Annunciation paintings uh, uh, throughout history. Uh, this interweaving of, uh, of program and form and space, <clears throat> the intersections of furniture, um, and uh, the, the more casual use of the space as it's imposed into the more ceremonial conditions uh, have for me been very important aspects of my work and uh, as I hope you'll see in some of the work I'll show you. Um, and, uh, and you can see here in this painting by Antonella de Messina, uh, the monk's cell uh, set in a more formal construct of architecture, but the actual apparatus <coughs> of his everyday uh, activities is a more informal, more casual object that sits within this space which accommodates his everyday program. I've also been very influenced by uh, landscape, the imposition of buildings and sites, uh, none more spectacular than the ruins of Carfley Castle in Wales um, with its waterworks, uh, it, its uh, landforms, again, exceptional to the city and interwoven into the city, obviously built for defense, um, or uh, Shenanso Castle, many buildings that activated uh, an idea of an expansive uh, form of landscape and integration to site and context, not sacrificing uh, and done through mimicry, but done through a very careful association of, of the integration of new buildings into, uh, into sites. One of my early commissions for a shop in New York City tried to explore this. I've been very involved in construction and craft and technology, uh, the uh, invention of new form, uh, and still have it be able to relate back to uh, the sites and existing conditions. <clears throat> Throughout uh, my practice, these projects have been worked on with a very intimate dialogue with uh, craftspeople. Um, you can see here the two iron workers who produced uh, this shop front in New York uh, many years ago. Um, uh, a very uh, careful attention to the way the steel was uh, welded together, uh, used in ways that weren't, uh, that were different from uh, the way materials were being used at the time, trying to make associations to the brownstone building that uh, I was uh, directly behind. And then a world of interiors in a project that was done on a, on a very uh, restrained budget, uh, uh, looking at uh, drywall, looking at, uh, at lighting that was in a way uh, uh, both uh, necessary to save money, but also in a way that produced a rather exceptional idea of, uh, of interior lighting. <clears throat> Right after that project, I, uh, st I was working on a set of drawings for, uh, for buildings and landscapes. Uh, I ran across this uh, piece of landscape in, in Michigan, uh, a canal, a waterway, and started to make drawings for a project for a house that was uh, uh, integrated into the site and into the landscape. The project went on for uh, some period of time, and then I was approached by uh, a musician, Ace Fraley, from the rock group KISS, who was in the process of looking for a way to keep his fans from uh, uh, being at his living room window every morning. Uh, I started working with him on this idea of a house situated in, in the middle of a canal of water. Um, these were uh, drawings for uh, a project, and later we revisited this recently with the publication of the book in some 
uh, computer <clears throat> animations, computer models. Uh, to see the building, but it was about finding uh, this moment in the site, this integration in the landscape um, when, um, when the building and the water came together through the entry sequence in the house as you move through the, through the, the site and landscape uh, to activate the color sequence of the building, to have sequences of space that were fixed on uh, points of view, uh, both on the canal and off the canal of water, to have steam rooms below grade, <clears throat> and then to see this uh, uh, greenstone clad uh, form situated in the middle of the site, uh, in the middle of the landscape. <clears throat> um, I've worked with old buildings uh, for quite a long time, as most urban architects do. This was a, a project in uh, Newport, Rhode Island for the renovation of the Calendar School building. Um, this was uh, a very long time ago. It was one of the first transformations of a school or industrial building into housing. Um, and uh, I found these uh, rather voluminous spaces inside the old building. It was a building that was sold at auction from the city of Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, the owner wanted to build an apartment for himself and, and uh, an array of apartments that would be, uh, be sold within the building. And this was an integration of, of making apartments that were particular. They were particular to the, to the position they were in in the building. They were particular to the configurations of the existing space. In this case, the owner's living and dining room, which uh, opened into a 33-foot high uh, interior. Um, seen here from the study, looking down at the, their collection of antique furniture. And it was both, for me, interesting because the, the owner of the property, uh, uh, both because of the landmark status of the building, but also because he had a collection of antique furniture. And the architect who had the commission before me told him that he should um, that she should take the furniture out, out to the yard and set it on fire and burn it. Um, he didn't want to actually work on a solution that would integrate the antique furniture with a new interior. I found it to be an interesting challenge. I found um, that the collection fit very well into the interior. It helped bridge the distance between the historic building built in 1860 and the new interiors, which were referenced by a lot of buildings that the owner and his wife found very compelling. For them, you can see here all of the various units uh, that were positioned within the building. Their colors and their forms were, um, were synchronized with the north, south, east, west position in the building. Some of the structural anomalies that were found, roof trusses, uh, interior columns. Um, here you can see the plans were a very intricate uh, set of interior designs uh, all pulled and gathered to the center of the building to, to make the maximum use of the volumetric space, but also uh, to avoid having second means of egress out of the building with fire escapes and stairs, which would have really ruined um, the landmark status of the existing building. Uh, the drawings uh, throughout my practice have always sought to explore both the emotional and technical qualities of the building uh, and the interiors that we've been pursuing. And here you can see a kind of nighttime view uh, looking at the uh, interiors through the walls of the old building. And of course, setting up a, a very strong relationship in terms of the geometry of the outside and the inside was extremely important. Um, I've worked on all kinds of larger scale projects, uh, competitions, this for the peak in Hong Kong, um, uh, a very, uh, strong uh, composition of landform and, and building forms uh, set. It was a very uh, substantial brief that was given during that competition. Um, here you can see uh, various attributes of the building, timeshared housing, the owner's complex, and then all the public buildings gathered toward the center. Um, the Paris Opera competition in which, um, uh, although we didn't, we didn't win the competition, the project was published extensively, um, sought to really, again, bridge the distance between the choices that were offered in the brief of being able to demolish uh, uh, buildings on the site, which we uh, really struggled to keep, a lot of the existing buildings, found a use in the main square for an outdoor public theater, uh, found a subway line running underneath, created a subway station at the Spur Canal, 
uh, to the to the River Seine, uh, called it. It was really an opera for the people, um, and uh, and really looked at an evolution of the texture of the city of Paris to see how we could continue that texture in a new building, which would be part of that site. Here, an interior section of the auditorium, and then final views around the overall model and the city itself. Um, it's a small building done for um, a very famous American novelist, uh, a, a, a building really for swimming, an indoor lap pool building uh, in western, uh, western Connecticut. Uh, it was a building that uh, really sought to explore, again, the relationship between a small outbuilding on the site, a little wooden clabbered building, uh, this new long, thin uh, building situated between uh, stone walls and the, and the garden and landscape. It was really about the fabrication, both the simplicity and complexity of the structure of the building, uh, providing a place for swimming that, um, uh, that the owner uh, didn't want to feel like he was in prison, although he, he had to do these laps every day for his, for his bad back. Um, producing lighting, it was a pool that was demanded not to be made in ceramic, so this entire building is made in, in, uh, in wood, uh, marine plywood on the interior and, uh, and wood on the outside. Here you can see sections through the interior, the joinery of the marine plywood with walnut inlays um, through the sections and skylights and door configurations really explore the way buildings are made in, in stick and wood frame construction, the variant possibilities for how the wall yields to light and how the wall uh, begins to express, uh, to more formally express uh, the openings onto this very large meadow uh, beyond. Uh, another competition in Stonington, Connecticut explored the relationship to the uh, Captain Nathaniel Palmer Mansion. This was a, a building that was a uh, uh, large, formidable structure in the middle of the city. Uh, Captain Palmer was one of the founding, uh, founding families of uh, Stonington, Connecticut. Uh, the project was to design a, an archive and, and a library and exhibit building. This was the Ice House, which was uh, one of the old outbuildings. So the project that, <clears throat> that I uh, laid out was a project that would really complete, would make a complex of this uh, compound of buildings, uh, take a, uh, a more low key, uh, position, allow the Palmer Mansion to remain the focal point to the composition, and produce a courtyard in the middle of the building, a separate entrance from the parking area uh, so that people would enter into the archive building. Um, here you can see varying views of the, of the model, the front of the mansion building, the interior of the project with the archive in which we designed all of the uh, aspects and interior furniture. Uh, of this with a library uh, reading room in the front, the exhibit room, and the archive, uh, as you can say, arrayed back from the entry here with all the casework and, um, uh, and interior cabinet work. Um, <clears throat> interiors, uh, because of an urban practice, I think remain a focal point uh, to the work that we've done um, here, a loft in Chelsea um, in which uh, the found room was a brick container uh, discovered under an old tin ceiling uh, built in uh, the late 1800s, early 1900s um, in uh, Chelsea and Manhattan, uh, a, a building that had windows only front and back. Uh, so the volume of space within that building, and it's the, the tall building here on the on the right side was an old sewing loft. Um, you can see in the model uh, the disposition of elements uh, of converting a residence uh, was important because the artists uh, wanted to make sure that the the concept of the loft remained intact, that you could, that they would be able to experience the expanse of space from the back to the front. Although they required now rooms of privacy for their family, um, they, they really wanted both things. So there's a small studio in the front, there's a, a kitchen, dining, and living area in the middle, uh, the master bedroom and, and uh, master bathroom and, and child's rooms are set in the back, but from all the way through, from the front to the back, you can see through those spaces. 
um, uh, the imposition of elements is now rendered in, in uh, skim coat plaster uh, with a lot of plywood panels to bridge, again, the warmth and texture of the brick uh, building to protect some of the plaster, to produce a second layer of design uh, to the project uh, with an intricacy and, and set of details and warmth that, um, that uh, again, makes an association to a world of architecture with, which preceded this. You can see the um, elaboration of details and stairs uh, with hardwoods used in softwoods. Uh, again, uh, programmatic devices that were elaborated um, and developed uh, over time. Um, Public buildings have remained, for me, uh, a very important goal in our practice. Um, we've worked on, on several of these, this for a student union, addition to the student union building at Queens College, uh, shown uh, here. Uh, uh, the existing student union is a 1960s brutalist building. Uh, Queens College was a, was a, a campus that was, uh, uh, was transformed from what was an old mental institution uh, in the 1800s. You can see these old mission-style buildings. These were the original buildings of the main quad and main campus. In the 60s, um, this building was built. Um, not a, a, a rather rough building, not very well liked on the campus. Uh, the president asked that we uh, provide additional space and provide some screen uh, behind which uh, we could hide the brutalist building from the main campus. Um, the building was designed all in limestone uh, with copper uh, roofs and details, uh, woodwork in all of the windows and doors. But it was still necessary to make an association to the entrance of the building. We designed a set of plazas that ran around the building that linked all of the public spaces. There was a proposed laboratory building uh, that was supposed to be done on Casino Boulevard uh, here in the foreground, which. Um, eventually was never done. The interior range of spaces through the building uh, featured a 450-seat uh, theater, uh, a whole series of rentable uh, seminar rooms which had their own particular uh, light and space characteristics, so they would be differentiated. And then there were a series of restaurants and, uh, and uh, rat skellers that ran through the bottom for students' use uh, for parties and other festive occasions. Um, the building w was the beginning of an exploration of uh, looking back at stone building. Um, uh, having run uh, programs in sustainability uh, at City College, I was struck uh, by many of the scientists um, who have been very adamant about architects' responsibility for the environment. And the most important characteristics as I've come to understand about sustainability have to do with the durability of the buildings. It has to do with their ability to last for a very long time. Um, buildings that are built on a 15 or 20 year life cycle are at an astonishing rate of, of, um, uh, of using up the built environment. Uh, if we don't build buildings the way we built buildings a long time ago, um, we will deplete the environment at an alarming rate. Um, so it's not about glass, although I think glass is a relatively problematic material. Um, they're materials that need to be rebuilt on a 20 or 25 year life cycle, and that is a bit of a problem. So I was already starting to look for other reasons because I thought the material association and the dissonance um, of new buildings to historic environments was something that should be looked at because I started to listen to clients who had a great deal of difficulty with what modern architecture was building, its inability to, to feel part of the, of the rest of the environments that, that uh, certainly in institutions were entrusted with safeguarding. And I thought, well, maybe there was a way to do both things. Maybe there was a way to bridge the distance between uh, doing new work and also having a stronger relationship. So I was starting to look at details of stonework and, um, and uh, more, the more formal uh, capabilities uh, of the building, which I think you'll see played out in subsequent work. Um, this uh, project for a small addition and renovation to a house in Westchester, again, uses a much softer, warmer palette of materials, this all in mahogany, limestone uh, details, um, uh, collecting water from the roof of the building, returning it into, 
into drainage systems and, and cisterns that go back uh, into the ground, as you can see here in the, in the drawings of the water collection system and the spillways uh, and troughs that uh, return the water back to the natural environment. Um, screens and, and woodwork systems and panels that were meticulously fabricated. Uh, these are all uh, machine cut stone, uh, shop cut uh, woodwork, and then assembled and all put together uh, on site. And here you can see the drainage uh, system, the stairs that open from the fielded doors that uh, change the light on the inside of a very small uh, house, the integration of stonework into an existing porch in the rear yard, new patterning and textures. All of these developed in a, in a much more elaborate material, set of material associations. Uh, again, to, to get away from the, the uh, blandness and, and uh, abstractness that has, I think, become uh, our representation of, of modern architecture into an architecture that really has a much longer tradition, a much longer association to the craft of how we make things. Uh, here, some uh, stone stairways that cover over a rough concrete set of steps that go up from the porch, uh, or a spillway which is set into an existing uh, brick uh, uh, terrace. <clears throat> Part of that commission also included a rather tragic loss of a family member uh, and uh, the uh, uh, ability to deal more overtly in the representation of, uh, of memory uh, through the celebration of a, of a family monument. Um, again, uh, this is a, a very large historic building in the middle of Manhattan on 75th Street, uh, a project that, um, that was a, a uh, landmark building on the exterior. The interior, however, had been gutted over, over many years. This is a 20,000 square foot building for two people. Uh, it included a screening room. It included into a lap pool. Uh, it included a series of rooms and, uh, and places of specific design, a library, master bedroom suite, an interior courtyard that went up through four floors of the building, um, a living and dining room. Um, again, the integration of, of furniture, of woodwork, of lighting, of, um, of transformations into the existing conditions of a building uh, with textures, patterns, and new furniture that would really explore a very different range of design. Uh, a project for a house uh, in Connecticut that um, uh, was a very large uh, family structure. Um, uh, again, situated in a huge expanse of, of nature, uh, a cold weather building, uh, uh, really uh, designed uh, with um, maximum roof slopes to be able to remove snow, uh, woodwork that could close down the building and close windows when uh, the parties weren't there. But a, a ceremonial set of spaces, including this copper uh, entry hall, a series of master bedrooms, interior courtyards, <clears throat> and indoor uh, pools and material associations that um, uh, really started to explore a very different condition <clears throat> of housemaking. Uh, this is in upstate New York from the more pristine glass uh, boxes that one sees um, as being represent, represented of, uh, of our modern way of life. Um, this was designed all in color-infused plaster on the interior, um, uh, copper. This is the indoor uh, swimming pool. You can see the expanse of, of nature beyond and uh, uh, all the details uh, within the interior pool. <clears throat> um, I had the opportunity to propose a structure uh, on 31st Street next to the McKinmead and White, last surviving building in McKinmead and White, uh, the power plant building uh, that was part of the old Penn, Pennsylvania station complex. <clears throat> um, although the interior was designed by, uh, it was a hybrid building designed by an engineer, uh, the exterior of the building was designed by, uh, uh, by McKinmead and White. And we found a sliver space um, adjacent to the building. Amtrak, uh, working with HOK, Amtrak asked for what possibly could be done with the building. We looked at a conference center and small uh, uh, hotel uh, that would uh, uh, be able to uh, accommodate the 
um, the relationship to the old building. We were looking to move the train board, which for the Eastern Seabird train board, which is on 9th Avenue and 31st Street, over into the old building. There's a five-story coal chute that runs through that building that used to be the uh, that used to store the coal for the uh, for the burners that were in the lower part. Which since electric power um, were not used anymore, we were looking for that as a conference center. And then here um, you can see meeting rooms and special suites and, and spaces that were um, within this uh, uh, tower that again tried to make a an association to the site and location. We continue to do a lot of interiors. This for uh, a set of uh, a small uh, a combination of two apartments in again in Chelsea uh, woodwork that can transform the interior out of out of the uh, uh, plain white vanilla boxes here an addition on Park Avenue uh, in the rear which extended the building uh, uh, underpin this was an open space on columns that the, this owner had added this glass uh, pavilion. Um, uh, we were asked to then encapsulate that pavilion in a new uh, uh, dining room and, and breakfast room and terrace. Again, it's, it's in uh, stone. It's all in, uh, in poured concrete with uh, dolomite stone on the outside and P.H. or Serena green accent stone. You can see some of the interior drawings in here, a view of the dining room um, and, and lighting. It was a kind of complicated structure with beams running all over the place that were holding up the, the terrace above. Um, I've done a lot of furniture uh, over the years, both production furniture and individual pieces. This was a, a small uh, table done for AI uh, uh, Atelier International uh, furniture, this in, in sheet bronze and cast bronze, uh, silver, uh, the assembly of that uh, table as you see it here pictured in a space. Uh, glassware for the Murano Glassworks in uh, Venice. Um, this is in the in the museum in Venice. It was part of a, a show actually um, uh, sponsored by the museum many years ago, and that's uh, has spawned has spawned a whole set of glassware designs, which we're in the process of pursuing now. Here are some of the prototypes uh, for tumblers, chalices, uh, uh, drinking glasses, wine glasses, and the like. Some details. These are gold leaf and and uh, blue uh, crystals set within the the cast glass. We continue to do uh, furniture. This uh, for an apartment here in New York for a uh, uh, for a family uh, uh, from out of town. Uh, we've designed all of their custom uh, all of their living, dining, and bedroom furniture. Uh, these are uh, uh, chairs, all made in. Uh, in lacquered wood uh, with uh, Venetian fabric uh, furniture that really looks to be both uh, volumetric and sustainable and solid, but also uh, obviously explore new materials and continue in an advocacy for modern design and its ability to be part of the built environment. Uh, I was very lucky to do uh, two projects, um, which I'll close by showing you one which uh, was done uh, while I was still in the faculty of Yale University um, for a small uh, building at, at Yale just down the block from the James Gamble Rogers uh, Law School complex. Uh, this was in, a, in around 99-2000. And the project, the Gamble Rogers buildings are, are just at the end of the block. This is uh, uh, Broadway. Uh, there were a row of commercial buildings, the Yale Co-op, which is just off to the left. And, um, and the, the project really um, uh, had to do with coming to understand this legacy of, of intricate buildings at Yale. Um, these buildings that I had looked at my, the entire time I taught there for more than uh, 24 years, um, buildings that were, uh, that were, had a, a magical hold on everybody who was in the campus, um, clearly buildings that you couldn't replicate, but um, buildings that you could clearly learn from. And I was taken by the dexterity of James Gamble Rogers. I was taken by the, the intricacy of the buildings, their, their, the range of public spaces, the intimacy of private spaces, uh, the material complexities um, and intricacies of patterning and stonework, um, buildings that were both formal and informal. They could go between being uh, 
strikingly organized uh, compositionally with formalized spaces. And yet, if you looked in, in, their, in the way the buildings were used, they were, um, they were, um, uh, they had a casual uh, process to them, axes that didn't always complete themselves. The way you entered buildings was sometimes off-center. Uh, doorways were located where more precisely the doorway should be located. And I became struck by this ability uh, for the architects of that period, and I think throughout the, the architects that I found uh, more interesting, H.H. H. Richardson, Frank Lloyd Wright, um, uh, Louis Sullivan, uh, to be able to have this flexibility, this planning flexibility, to give up the relentless formalism of the project and, and to make these kind of what appeared to be almost picturesque adjustments to the building to produce the, the locations for entrances and, and proximities um, to other, other functional uh, things that needed to be accommodated. So um, we were commissioned to do this small two-story building on that street. I started to explore the ability for this building to uh, make a material association to the James Gamble Rogers work. Uh, this was in limestone, uh, copper, uh, uh, wood windows, and casting stone, uh, limestone lintels, to be able to look at the detail and patterning. Uh, the project was not able to be built, but we were able to, to um, finally execute this work in a building for the New York City Housing Authority in New York, known as the Saratoga Avenue Community Center. Uh, I'll run through these quickly. Here you can see the limestone, the casting stone uh, details of the building. Um, this was a building that had to make an association to an existing community. It was a building built for the city of New York, so for me it was very important that this building had uh, and was able to carry the message of uh, and the legacy of public building in New York. Uh, I purposely chose to make the building a masonry building. Um, this was done within the construct of a New York City Housing Authority budget. We had not 10 cents more than any other firm who did mostly um, curtain wall buildings. Uh, but I was committed to the, the uh, building a building that was materially substantive, which had a representational capability that could say, this is a public building. We do represent the city of New York. To provide the residents with a place where they could have ceremonial parties, um, which the interior room is used for on weekends, uh, a place where kids do homework in the afternoon, uh, where they have early morning uh, uh, preschool uh, celebrations and, and training programs, senior center, but more importantly, uh, a ceremonial space, a connection to the uh, outdoor set of terraces and environment, and then finally, uh, a building that's rich in texture, rich in detail, um, and was really able to explore a set of materials and building techniques that were both modern and connected to the history of architecture. The cover of my new book, and I thank you very much for your time.